Hey everybody, welcome back to Blue HQ. And today, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about oxygen sensors. Yes, I'm talking about ah, these little guys, the things that are in your rebreather that tell you how much oxygen is in your mix. And these things are really important because without oxygen sensors, we basically couldn't have rebreathers because if you don't know what you're breathing, you can't really run a rebreather. So these things are really important and a lot of people don't quite understand them. So I thought maybe a video to talk about oxygen sensors a little bit about how they work and also a little bit about what goes wrong when they get old so you'll understand a little bit more about the care and maintenance of your rebreather's oxygen sensor. So I'm gonna start with an unlikely um, beginning to this story. I wanna talk about batteries. So I'm hardly an expert on batteries, but in your basic alkaline battery, you essentially have two chemicals that are separated by a membrane. And the cathode is manganese dioxide and the anode is basically zinc. And how the battery works is a kind of a tricky chemical reaction where um, hydroxide ions, these are ions of oxygen and hydrogen, are passing through this membrane and oxidizing the zinc. Basically, oxidizing means rusting it. And you're, when you do that, you free up some electrons and those go out into the circuit and they power your flashlight or whatever. And then they come back in the top and they fuel this reaction. And what happens is this reaction will go on as long as the chemical, there's enough chemicals in there to create the reaction. When the zinc gets fully oxidized or the manganese runs out of ions, the battery is dead. And what happens is it slowly degrades over time. The battery, the voltage of the battery will drop and drop and drop until you finally, your flashlight gets kind of dim and you're like, okay, it's time to replace the battery. So why am I talking about batteries in a video about oxygen sensors? I'm getting there. You may have seen hearing aid batteries in your local pharmacy or hardware store. You've probably seen these little button cell batteries that look like the kind that would go in your calculator or you know something, except that it has this weird tab on it. And when you pull the tab off, there's actually some micro tiny little holes underneath this tab. What's going on here? Okay, this is what's known as an air battery, which is to say that the oxygen that fuels the reaction in this battery comes from the atmosphere. Now, why would you do that? Well, in a chemical battery like this, if the circuit's not hooked up and the electrons aren't flowing, the reaction is much, 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 much slower but it's still doing its thing, which is to say that this battery has a pretty limited shelf life. So uh, when you buy it, even if you don't use it, it's sitting in a drawer, it's slowly getting weaker. The advantage of an air battery is that until you pull the tab off and start the reaction with oxygen, the battery's basically inert because there's no oxygen to make the reaction happen. So. Why aren't all batteries air batteries? Well, because the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere that runs these produces a pretty slow reaction and you can't get a lot of current out of one of these. These batteries are really only suitable for applications where you don't need a whole lot of juice. They're perfect for a hearing aid. Um, so you could have a whole bunch of these on the shelf and they're not gonna go bad and they're not gonna start the reaction till you pull the tab off and let the oxygen in. Now here's the thing that's interesting about one of these batteries. They're designed to make a certain amount of voltage based on the amount of oxygen that's in our atmosphere, which is to say they're, they're designed to work at a PO2 of 0.21. Now, 
If you don't know about PO2, you're gonna need to know about that for this video. So watch the PO2 video and come back. Uh, if you do know about PO2, you're, you're with me. So this battery is designed to work basically in air at sea level at one atmosphere. What do you think would happen if I put this battery in a chamber full of pure oxygen? Well, the voltage would go up. Uh, because there would be more oxygen available for the reaction. I don't recommend that because these batteries are not designed for that. I am not certain that this battery would not catch fire if you did that. Do not try that. However, <laughs> it would basically produce more voltage in response to a higher partial pressure of oxygen, which means that this little hearing aid air battery is a crude, primitive oxygen sensor because it basically works exactly the same way as an oxygen sensor. So let's talk about that. So an oxygen sensor is basically an air battery and it has a big giant hole where the oxygen can go in and react with the um, stuff that's in there. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I actually don't really know much about the chemical reaction that they do with the oxygen, but it, it definitely runs out after a while, just like an air battery, when all of the materials in the battery have reacted with the oxygen and there's no more, the battery dies and you have to replace it. Same thing. So you can think of an oxygen sensor as basically a little battery that runs on oxygen. And after a while, the chemical in here that reacts with the oxygen runs out and the, ba and the battery, the sensor, dies. So on one end, you have where the oxygen goes in, and on the other end, you've got a couple of pins where the voltage comes out, and this device produces a voltage in response to the partial pressure of oxygen on it. So how are they used in a rebreather? Well, typically in a rebreather, you have at least one, maybe up to more than five sometimes, but typically three in a rebreather. You have three of them and they each read out on your computer and your comp you can either read the millivolts, how, how much voltage is coming out of these. I'll come back to that in a minute. Or once you've calibrated the computer, the computer can convert the millivolts into a partial pressure of oxygen. And that conversion has to be done with a calibration where you tell the computer, I'm putting this much oxygen in and you take that millivolt and convert it into the PO2 that we know what it is. And so that's a calibration, come back to that. And these things will read out on your display and by using them, you can tell what you're breathing. Why three? Well, okay. If you had just one and it was not reading out well, how would you know? So then you're like, oh, well, we should have two. But if you have two and they disagree, how do you know which one's right? So three means that hopefully only one is busted. If one of them is busted, two of them are going to agree and one of them is going to disagree. And you can say, ha, huh, I'm not gonna trust that one. I'm gonna trust the two that agree. So that's kind of the reason why most rebreathers run with three. Now, let's talk about this whole calibration thing. Okay, so how much voltage does one of these things put out? A brand new sensor, depends on the brand, depends on the type, but at least the ones for my KISS rebreather, when they're brand new, at a PO2 of one, okay, which means that they're in a pure oxygen environment at one atmosphere on the bench at the dive shop. They'll put out about 50 millivolts, okay? So 50 millivolts is 0.05 volts, which is to say 1 30th as much voltage is in a AA battery. We're talking about a very small amount of voltage, teeny weeny, teeny, teeny, teeny weeny. So your dive computer has to analyze that voltage and know what it is and measure it. And then when we calibrate, what we'll do is we'll, we'll set this thing up on, on the bench at the dive shop, right? 
and we're going to set it up at a PO2 of 1, okay, this thing is going to put out 50 millivolts right there, okay? So we're going to tell the computer, calibrate. And then what's going to happen is it's going to say, okay, at a PO2 of 1, this sensor puts out 50 millivolts. Now, there's three sensors. One of them probably puts out 50 millivolts, and one puts out 52 millivolts, and one puts out 48 millivolts. It's going to do an individual calibration for each sensor. But let's just look at one sensor of those three. So here's one sensor of those three. And now a sensor that's working properly has a linear response, which is to say that if it's putting out 50 millivolts at a PO2 of 1, then if you go up to a PO2 of 2, which of course would be too high to be safe diving, but in theory, if you go up to a PO2 of 2, the voltage should be 100 millivolts. It's a linear response. And what that means is that once your computer is calibrated at this point and it assumes a linear response, that means that when you're on the dive, if your PO2 is like uh, 1.3, right there, it's going to be getting some millivolts out here, and it's going to be calibrated. So we've calibrated. This, is, this graph over here is our computer. The computer says 50 millivolts is 1. And so when it sees this, if it sees this, it's going to say 2. But if it sees this, it should say 1.3 because this voltage should be the right amount because it's linear. And that's how a calibration works. Now, what happens when the sensor starts to get old? Well, what happens is the voltage drops. The chemical reaction is not working as well. And so it's no longer going to give you 50 millivolts for a PO2 of 1. In fact, Maybe it gives you um, 40 millivolts for a PO2 of 1. Now that's okay. It's okay because, in theory, the thing is still working fine. There is a point at which, when it gets so low that your dive computer is going to be like, no, I'm not going to calibrate that. The voltage is so low, I don't trust it. And for every computer, those numbers are different, and I don't even know what they are, so don't ask. But at some point, they'll be too low. But if they go down a little bit, the computer's going to be like, okay, that's cool. So we're, we're at a, we're at a 1.0. We do a calibration. It says, okay, 40 millivolts. And that means we can reasonably expect that at 2.0, I think you can do the math, we should be getting, like, basically 80 millivolts. And so basically... The same thing, at a 2.0, we'd be up here somewhere, and we should be here at 80 millivolts. And what that means is that we're still linear, but just the whole line moved down. And we can still calibrate, and the sensor is still going to be accurate. But here's what happens when a sensor gets really old and starts to poop out. Sometimes it'll, let's say we're down at, we're all the way down at, I need a different color. <laughs> Let's say we're all the way down at 30 millivolts. And we're assuming that we're going to have a linear response up. But what actually happens as a sensor gets old is it's not linear anymore. At 30 millivolts, at, at PO2 of 1.0, it might give you 30 millivolts. And your computer might be okay, and it'll calibrate, but it actually isn't linear. What actually happens is, as the PO2 goes up, the voltage sags like that. And that's, that is a sensor that's going bad. So its baseline voltage is not low enough for the computer to totally reject it, so the computer will calibrate. But as the PO2 goes up, the voltage sags. And what that means is your computer is assuming this, 
And so your computer is saying, oh, I'm getting a voltage, and I'm assuming that voltage represents a PO2 of maybe uh, 1.5, and you're like, oh, that's too high, I gotta do something about it. But actually, you're way out, high, way higher than 1.5. And so you are diving along, and basically what this does, the net effect of this is that as your PO2 goes up, your computer becomes less and less accurate and it reads on the low side, which is to say you could have a dangerously high PO2 and it looks normal. So your computer's like, oh, you're at 1.3 and you're all happy. This is good, it's perfect. But you're actually at 1.6 or 1.7. And so if you decide to come up and do some deco or something and you crank your PO2 up and you think you're okay because you're cranking it up to 1.5 for deco, you might actually be pushing it way, way into unsafe territory. So, how do you avoid this? Like, how do you know? So, when I was certified on my rebreather, my instructor, Ed Sorensen, drilled into us a very important test at the beginning of every dive. So, you're gonna go down, you're gonna calibrate your computer to a PO2 of 1.0 at the surface, and so that your computer says, 1.0 when the unit is completely filled with oxygen at sea level. And then you're gonna go down to 20 feet and, at, and you're gonna fill that rebreather completely. You're gonna flush it with oxygen. And then you're gonna make sure that your computer says 1.6 because mathematically at 20 feet, pure oxygen is a PO2 of 1.6. If your computer says 1.4 when you're you know the oxygen has to be at 1.6 because pure O2, 20 feet, 1.6, they don't agree, you have a sensor or sensors that are bad. Their voltage is non-linear, they're dropping. This is the reason that that test is so important at the beginning of a dive, especially the beginning, your first dive of the trip where maybe your sensors haven't been used in a while and you're not sure if they're good, you definitely need to do this test. And a lot of people skip it because it, it, it takes a minute. I'll give you a little tip on this. When you do your pre-breathe at the surface, first flush with dill and check your diluent, then flush with O2, and then as you're going down at the beginning of the dive, turn off your ADV so you don't get anything, any dill put in the mix. Only flush, fill your lung with pure O2. When you get to 20 feet, stop. You shouldn't have to do much. It's already got pure O2. Just take a quick look exactly at 20 feet, not 24 feet, not 18 feet, 20 feet. Look, should be 1.6 or pretty darn close. And if it is, your sensors are good. If you have one or two sensors that are reading low, they are non-linear. So they were making enough voltage to calibrate, but they are not making enough voltage at high PO2s to be safe. You should either call the dive, it's up to you. If it's one sensor, you could either call the dive or you could decide that you're not gonna trust that sensor for the dive, that's up to you, depending on how big of a dive we're talking about. If it's a casual little dive, you might wanna just ignore it. If it's a big dive, you might wanna go change that sensor. So, in any case, that, ladies and gentlemen, is a little basic primer to O2 sensors. Um, they're very important. They do go bad. I had one go bad within a month of being brand new. You cannot assume that because the date says it's good until such and such date that it will be. And you cannot assume that just because it says it expired six months ago that it's expired. Those are like rules of thumb. You have to test them. And um, I've seen sensors go years. And then I've also seen sensors go like die almost immediately. So who knows? Something was wrong inside. So this is why we test them. Um, Everything in a rebreather is pretty simple. It's a bag that you breathe through with some scrubber to take out the CO2. It's not rocket science. These things are what keep you alive. Those babies. If you're too cheap to replace them when they need to be replaced, 
that's bad. You shouldn't own a rebreather. Seriously, don't be cheap. They're like $85, okay? Replace them when they're bad. Always have a spare. And don't be afraid to say, this one's wonky, I'm replacing it. They're just not that expensive, and I'm sure that your life is worth more than $85. So if you have any questions, put them down below. I'll try to answer. As usual, if I can't answer them, I'll get Todd or somebody to figure it out. Uh, until the next time, have fun, dive safe, and see you in the blue world. Hey everyone, thanks for watching our latest episode all the way to the end. Hit that subscribe button now so you won't miss our next episode.